What's up YouTube, this is Tube Digger. This video is the first in a four part series where I'm gonna create a drum and bass track from scratch using my MPC-1. If you've got an MPC Live, MPC Live Mark II, MPC X or an MPC Touch and the MPC software, all of the techniques in this video will apply to those machines. But of course, if you've got an Akai Force, most of the techniques will apply to that. It's just that, as you may know, the sequencer works a little bit differently in the Akai Force. Now, just a bit of a disclaimer, I've tried my very best to show you all the kind of things that I do in the privacy of my own studio without the scrutiny of a camera and a microphone so I can show you guys. So there might be some things where I skip over and you might think, I didn't see you do that. How did you do that? But please do ask anything in the comments and I'll try my best. But I do cover lots of ground in this video and there's obviously gonna be lots of repetition where I'm playing stuff back. So please bear with that. It's just the nature of making music, as you know, if you do that yourselves in your own home. So as ever, I'd like to thank all my current subscribers, anyone that's liked and shared my videos, anyone that follows and supports me on social media, and once again, of course, anyone that's been very generous and donated to this channel. If you'd like to do that yourselves, there's a PayPal link in the description. It's a PayPal me link, which means you can use other funding sources other than PayPal, so you don't need a PayPal account. But if you don't wanna do that, absolutely no hard feelings at all. If you're interested in private lessons with myself, please contact me at tubedigger at gmail.com for more details. These can be conducted over Skype, Zoom, or Google Hangouts, whatever you prefer. So as ever, a blank project is at 120 beats per minute. So the first thing that I'm gonna do is change that to 170, which is my preferred tempo for jungle and drum and bass. We've got two bars and I just now need to go to the browser and start loading some sounds in. So what I'm gonna do is create a simple kit and possibly convert that into a new sample that I can chop up in the same way that I would a classic breakbeat. So first of all, I'm gonna find a kick drum. I'm just gonna go into this folder here and this is a folder called Queensbridge Story. It was a sample pack that I actually won from Native Instruments. So it's got a load of old school boom bap hip hop samples. So let's try and find a suitable kick for this break. That's quite nice. I might load in a few of these. That's quite nice. So what I quite like to do sometimes is put all my kicks in this first column, snares on the next column, and hi-hats here if I want to interchange between different types of kits or if I just can see that I might need to use some different combinations or create some additional samples. One thing that I've not mentioned explicitly in my videos is sample selection. Someone actually contacted me recently for a private lesson and they said they had trouble finding the right sounds or rather the right combination of sounds. It's something that comes to you after years and years of practice and experience, I believe. I used to have this problem, so I'd choose a really nice kick drum and then I'd find it was quite difficult sometimes to find a complimentary snare to go with a kick, but it is something that your ears get accustomed to. So I'm gonna start finding some snares now that will work with one or more of these kicks. So it's not always about just finding a sound that you like. It actually has to be a, you know, a two-way thing where that sound that you like does work with another sound that you like, particularly when it comes to drums, where of course we've got multiple elements to deal with.
think this one might go nicely with this. quite like that that might not actually work with this kick but I like it a lot so I want to try and use it and of course we've got all the processing facilities and parameters that you can affect sounds within the program editor which I'm going to take full advantage of at some point in this video so we just need one more snare here we don't actually really need it but I just want a good selection or good palette of sounds that's quite nice yeah I mean, it's not the ideal snare that I can sort of envisage going with this kit, but I really like it, so I'm gonna add it to the kit. Now I need some hi-hats for my third column. Now this isn't a set in stone method, it's just my method, and if you choose to follow it, you might find it works better for you. That's okay. So this fourth column, um, the kind of breaks that I like most of the time have a ride cymbal just to give it that kind of jazzy feel and they really drive a break, particularly if you put compression or distortion or saturation. That's okay, I might have to pitch that up. Anyway, there's some good sounds in there. Now, if I don't use all of these snares in particular, I can use, or at least use them for the main snare in the break. I can use them as like the side stick or where you get the roll in a lot of rolling drum and bass. I'll show you what I mean as I go on. So I'm just gonna have a play about with these, see if they work. I mean, straight off the bat, that works well for me, and I can tell that some of these rides will be nice. I'm just gonna put a simple two bar pattern together with these. So just to go over what I've been doing there, I've shortened this ride because I'm gonna eventually apply some distortion and compression and I know that this sound will dominate too much because it's on the 1 8 notes, it's repeating faster than everything else. And it's just one of those sounds which can be quite disruptive when once you've added a compressor or distortion. And you might have noticed I put a high pass filter on both of these sounds because we don't need any low frequencies that might be present in them. Now they haven't got them in them. I mean, they're just high frequency sounds as it is, but it's good practice to remove any unwanted frequency content that might interfere with other sounds. Something that I quite like to do with snares is put a low pass filter, maybe a low four or six, and it really brightens up the sound, just gives it a nice little crispy edge. So if you listen to this sound on its own with no filter, and now with a low six, it gives it a bit of brightness and if you add some resonance, it gives it quite a lot of brightness. 
particularly if you start bringing the frequency cut off just down slightly. So I'm going to copy this snare, press copy, press on the screen, press pad six, let's do it. And now I'm going to make this into what is kind of like the side stick of this main snare. So there's lots of ways we can do this. We can simply use the attack, hold, decay, sustain envelope. So I think I'm gonna to need to resample it. Maybe I'll do that after I've added some effects. I'm gonna do this via the track mixer. So one of my favorite effects might come as a surprise to some of my new viewers, but it's one of the oldest effects in the MPC and it's the distortion grimy, just because it's got a lot of timbral control. You've got a dry wet balance, you've got the drive, the grime doesn't really do too much on drums specifically. It adds a tiny little bit of grit, but it, it's almost pointless. I need to actually try this effect with some different sounds, but I'm gonna leave that for now. It's the center and the width. So the, these control the kind of frequencies that get affected by the distortion. And you can actually use this as a filter and the resonance as well. If you introduce that, that starts making things a bit gnarly and harsh. And then we've just got the output here. So I'm going to bring dry wet all the way to the bottom initially. Also the drive, it's good to just bring that down and just add a little bit with the data wheel there, maybe 10. really low drive amount it's just at five but the dry web balance is up quite high and I've got resonance of 15 and uh, you know it's kind of pointless me telling you the exact values because it's going to be different for everyone and the type of sound you're using but just to give you an idea it's just a case of obviously balancing and playing off some of these parameters with one another um, but just to show you this effect really, I've, I really like it. It's really good on breaks if you've managed to find a sweet spot. What I can do and what I often do is go back to the program editor, go back to the master page and then start playing around with the pitch of the entire program because sometimes you get even nicer sweet spots by affecting the entire pitch of a kit. Uh, there was one thing I wanted to do just before that and that's just try a slightly shorter snare. Because the distortion is really kind of making everything really fuzzy, it's quite good to shorten the sounds, which I did with the ride, you might remember, with the envelope. So if I do a similar thing with the snare, use the attack, hold, decay, sustain envelope, bring that all the way down. So I'm bringing the sustain all the way down. So this is just gonna be a tiny short snap. And then I can just choose the decay parameter and just drag that out. But this is something that I see people do all the time, affecting the sound in isolation. In my opinion, it's much better to play your sequence back and do it all in context with everything else. So you notice now that our main snare is actually shorter than the side stick. So I need to shorten that so it's shorter than the actual main snare.
Another thing that we can do is put a high pass filter on the kick drum and start messing about with the tonal quality of that. A high pass filter enables you to sweep right down to the resonant frequency of the kick drum and start using the resonance to put a spike in it. So let's put this at a high four. You're not gonna be able to hear this kick drum much now because I've taken all the low end out of it. So let's go back to the master and try out the semitones on this break. I might change uh, this snare a little bit. There's something about it that's not doing it for me. So that was another good reason to kind of bring in a few different snares and kicks to play with. I actually prefer this snare and you can see that I've swapped it out for both the main snare and the little side stick. Another thing you can do with the side stick, I hope that's the right terminology. Um, when I play drums, you give it you know that little roll and it's usually, it's not actually a, a traditional side stick right on the rim or on the side of the snare, it's just the little roll on the 16th. Now, what I might do is add some compression to this. I don't think any other sounds need anything else. We could uh, layer some stuff. So I quite like those double kicks. So I'll try and get them in the right place using note repeat. might be okay let's go to the main page go to the step sequencer okay so um, I don't want this one I just wanted two there just subtle so we've got this little double kick thing going on there What I'm going to do is bounce them to a sample and then put that into a chop program because that way it's just a quicker way that you can get some more interesting variations in the pattern rather than having to keep changing individual notes all the time. There you go, bounce the sample. Let's go to sample edit and find our bounce. Bounce sequence one. Process, I'm gonna normalize it. Now, this is another good thing that I like to do, and some engineers might say it's really bad practice, but I found that it really works if you're going for loudness and energy. And I've shown it in previous videos. Go to the process menu and choose a gain amount, which doesn't distort this, but saturates it and squares off the actual waveform. So it will go past the, the sort of normalization ceiling and it will square off the peaks but it actually boosts it up to quite a nice level. So it's hot and crunchy, but not actually digitally distorted. So I'm gonna choose initially plus four dB for the gain. Now you can see that it's squared off now. And to me, it looks okay. It looks like it's not gonna to be too, uh, too loud. Okay, that sounds fine to me. Now I'm gonna to go to chop. And because it's uh, an exact two bar loop, we can just choose an exact amount of regions. Now, 16's too much. We won't get any of the nice rolls and chops in there. 
Um, eight's probably okay, but again, it's just looking at two notes. I mean, what we can do actually is make eight chops. If we uncheck link slices, so what link slices does, if you don't already know, it allows you to freely put slice markers anywhere around the sample. It won't affect any of the other samples. So that's quite nice. And press and hold shift and convert. So I always use this option. It's the new drum program using slices and it's a non-destructive slice. And I don't create events because I want to program in my own unique pattern. So press do it. So I'm going to keep program 001, which is my original kit in memory. Um, just swap it out on this track and just press erase so we don't overlap the notes. And now I can change this into an eight bar sequence and just play about with these chops. So now that I've got the main kind of idea for a break, it's not the best break in the world, but I quite like it. And I'm not gonna to spend too much time on that for the sake of this video. Um, I'm gonna go up to a second track and I'm gonna switch programs to a key group program, go to my browser and try and get a sub bass sound. So in my expansions, I know I've got loads of those. They're not called sub, they're called 808. So let's do 808 and let's choose Dark Parallax and there's loads of good ones in this, um, in this uh, expansion pack. I need to go up to Pad Bank D and this is where the middle C will be. Now what you can do is a little bass trick when it comes to drum and bass is load the same sample onto an additional layer. So it's this one here, and just offset the semi-tunes or the fine tune. It depends what the sample is. But if you do that, it almost gives it a bit of a Hoover bass kind of quality. Just bear in mind that this will double up the volume to a point. So if we go to the next page, we can just offset these a little bit with our own individual levels. <laughs> Okay, so this means now that if I go up to track three, I'm gonna create another key group program, call this base two. So we don't need to really worry about calling the other one base one, as this will differentiate them. So we've got base two now. This is where I can add one of those other bass sounds. So go to the samples page, uh, make sure I'm pad back D, and let's find So you can hear that click when I release this because key group programs by default are set to note on. So it will stop immediately as soon as I pull my finger off. Ah! To get rid of that click, it's easy. We go to the amplitude envelope and just bring the release out to about 60, 64 is fine. So it doesn't tail off, but it stops smoothly. There's no click now. Another thing that you can do to get some kind of drum and bass type sounds is put a bit of wobble in this with the pitch, just something subtle so it's not complete cheesy wobble bass. So that's quite nice, but uh, maybe I can increase the actual uh, rate of that. That's not too bad. Let's have a play about with this with the other bass line. Okay, I quite like it immediately after. Yeah, maybe.
maybe that last high note for the last bar. That's not too bad. Now they're clashing a little bit and that tells me that I'm gonna to have to shorten this sample maybe. forgetting to shorten the main one here. The other thing that I want to do is I just want to bring down the level of bass two. It's a little bit loud. Go to the program editor. Uh, actually, we need to choose it from here program edit and I'm just going to put a bit of an attack uh, value in there because I don't like it sounds a bit too much like a kick Another thing that I want to try is the routing of these two programs. Uh, let's go to root and change the routing of them from output one and two to the submix, uh, submix one. This means now if I go to submix, uh, submixes, choose submix one, and now I can apply an effect to both of those. I'm going to try some compression just if I can get this um, kind of squashed and leveled out. Okay, that doesn't sound too bad. So now I'm gonna get into a bit more of the musical side of things. Now I don't like my drum and bass to be too musical. It can end up getting a bit corny and cheesy. So I'm gonna go up to track four, switch my program type to drum programs, add a new drum program, and rename this to sound effects or SFX. I always do this for my SFX tracks, just call them SFX, simple as that. And now I can go to the browser and let's load in some stuff from my own library. I'm just going to clear that search term. Go to Places, MPC, X, SSD, and go to Samples, Miscellaneous Recordings. Let's try that string kind of sound. Okay, let's go to program edit. It's got these top three pads here. I've already added a delay, so we can add the a bit of send to that pad. And because it's a long sound, I wanna change the sample playback to note on. And now we can go to 16 levels, and maybe make a melody out of this. Okay, that's quite a nice stab melody, so let's try that. Now I'm going to try something with eighth note triplets, or quarter note triplets, should I say. The easier thing to do is to latch note repeat, so double tap, and that latches. So that 
that's quite big and intrusive. So again, with this sound, we can go back to the sample editor and just bring out what we want from it. So I'm gonna just take this kind of sweep here maybe. Let's just do a fade in on that. Fade in and fade out. And I am, of course, going to normalize this. And then that means we just need to maybe turn it down in the pad mixer. So let's do that quickly now. Um, I've actually put these in pad bank D. That was a mistake. I, I should have these better organized in Padbank A, but it's because I was in a key group program first and it's just slipped my mind whilst make, making the video. Uh, but these should ideally be just in my sound effects bank in Padbank A. I can copy them. I think I'm gonna actually do that and use the new copy pads function. So copy pads. So we copy them from Padbank D to Padbank A. Do it. Now I can delete these pads. So if I press and hold shift and press copy, and pad bank A, now we've got the samples here. Uh, it does mean that I do have to grab the notes that are in pad bank D and just choose transpose. And because it's just one pad, because I use 16 levels, um, we just need to shift them down uh, just these single notes to pad 15, A15. <laughs> So what I did forget was these ones up here. Well, that's quite nice because I quite like the fact that it was just at the very start of the bar and then didn't occur again after bar five. So I'm going to cut those and just use this stab sound at the start of this eight bar sequence. <laughs> Okay, so that's quite a nice sound to fade up and then lead back into that. So we've got a full cycle loop. Um, which means, again, let's go to LFO modulation and change the sample play mode for this pad to note on. And I'm just gonna give it a tiny little bit of release so we don't get that click. Maybe a little bit longer than what I showed you with the bass sound earlier. So maybe 78, that should be good. And let's program that in so it fades up um, to lead us back round to the start. So I'm going to grab this and go into nudge mode and bring it back to here and see if that works a bit better. Let's just extend the end a little bit. Like in my previous video where I showed you the one sequence workflow, this is the point where I might start thinking about extending this to maybe 32 bars, um, adding a couple of little more variations with the sound effects or more sound effects. And that's when I would go, okay, it's time to double the length of this to 64 and again to 128 and then again to 256 for jungle. That will bring us up to around six, maybe just over six minutes at this current BPM of 170. So I'm gonna do that now. I'm gonna double the length twice. So now I've got 32 bars. And now I'm gonna start making this 32 bar uh, sequence more elaborate. And once I've done that, that's when I can move on and double the length to the full length of the song and then go back and reverse engineer it. So this video is gonna end here, guys. Stay tuned for part two, where I'm gonna work on this track and show you further processes and everything else that I'm gonna to do to actually get this track finished in front of you. I know some of it's a bit long-winded and repetitive, but that's just the nature of making music 
Um, I do this on my own all the time. Having the scrutiny of a camera or someone else is quite a different thing. Uh, you do have to obviously audition sounds a lot, play the same things back over and over again. And to show you guys that on YouTube, so you get an idea of uh, some of these processes which you can implement yourself if you choose to do so. That's just the way it is. So please stay tuned for part two where I'm going to further develop this track. Please don't forget to email me at tubedigger at gmail.com if you want private lessons. And I will see you on the other side. This is Tube Digger and I'm out.